should have thought about my spot better. <laughs> you must miss. No. Good morning, everyone. I'm so excited for this uh, great discussion that we have planned for you all, and excited to be hosting um, some amazing leaders with us this morning in this very unusual spot. <laughs> we were just talking about it before we started, and uh, the mayor said typically not a lot of great things happen under the bleachers, <laughs> but, but this, is, uh, this will be different, right? Um, you know, the, the topic so for our discussion this, uh, is uh, discussion resilience and, and in leadership. And, and this is definitely something that's been top of mind for anyone who has any leadership responsibilities over the last 18 months. So we want to learn from, from these amazing leaders about how they've been remaining resilient for themselves, for their teams, for their organizations. So allow me to start with just some, some introductions. Although I know he doesn't need an introduction, but um, you know, on my far left is uh, Mayor, the Honorable Mayor Ron Nuremberg, who is we're very lucky to call our mayor since 2017. And um, you know, Mayor Nuremberg is obviously a graduate of Trinity, 1999 graduate. And prior to that, he was a member of the San Antonio City Council, District 8, for uh, two terms. So we're very excited to, to have him. This is not the first time that he's interacted with um, the Trinity audience in general, as well as the healthcare administration audience. We had the pleasure of hosting him on Zoom last August in the midst of the pandemic, and, and he shared a lot of leadership insights. So we're very excited to, to have you with us. Um, on my right is um, Dr. Marissa Emmons. Marissa is also a graduate of the the healthcare administration program on the executive side. Um, she is a family physician and she currently serves as the vice president for ambulatory quality at Christus Trinity Clinic. And we're very excited to have you. Thank you for being here. And then right on my left is uh, Fritz Marthal. And, and Fritz is also a graduate of the Trinity Healthcare Administration program on the executive side. And he currently serves as the director of the ICU at St. David's Medical Center. Um, if you know the size of that organization in, in Austin, you would imagine how big that ICU is and how busy it, it is in regular times, let alone during pandemic times. So, so he's definitely had um, a lot of interesting experiences over the 18 months, and we want to want to hear that um, from him. Um, if you look at the schedule, there, there was another uh, leader that was supposed to be joining us, uh, Mike Russo's. Um, Mike called me yesterday and apologized for not being able to make it due to uh, personal reasons. He's in the midst of transition from San Antonio to Virginia and some some other personal stuff going on. But um, we, we wish uh, we wish uh, Mike the best. So I'm going to get us going here, and I'm going to start with you, Mayor Nuremberg by just asking you first, what, what does this idea of resilience mean to you within the context of leadership in general, but also within the context of, of your role and what you do in, in San Antonio? Well, thank you for having me. It's great to see everybody. And um, this is a very interesting setting for a panel discussion, but uh, perfect for our, the situation that we're in. So thank you. Uh, and it's great to join uh, the fellow panelists here. Um, resiliency for me is really about um, our ability to adapt to and meet the challenges that uh, are foreseen and unforeseen, uh, any number of circumstances. Uh, and certainly when we talk about resiliency with regard to city, uh, city services, city infrastructure, it's about being able to mitigate, work through disasters or emergencies. When I think about leadership resiliency, though, it, it's mostly about, um, in my personal uh, experience, it's about mental fortitude. It's about the ability to focus uh, and adapt uh, and to cut 
through the noise uh, of um, you know, what's happening around you to be able to uh, address the critical issues. Um, and whenever I hear the word resilience, I always think about uh, the, the video of uh, the interview that was done, I forget who was interviewing Bruce Lee at the time, but he was talking about uh, water and, and how water is shapeless and formless, but it's a, a very mighty force. Um, and while water um, you know, is penetrable and, and it is uh, soft to the touch, uh, but water can erode and, and has tremendous force and power, probably the, the most force and power of anything in the world. Uh, but what makes water um, important uh, with regard to resilience and how we think about it is that water is adaptable. Uh, you pour water in a cup, it becomes a cup. Pour water into a teapot, it becomes a teapot. The point of that is that you have to be adaptable. You have to um, work with the surroundings to be able to um, address the challenges and, and meet the needs of the of the situation. Thank you for that. These are um, great insights. Marissa, on your side, on the ambulatory side, and in your role as a physician and on the quality side in healthcare, what does resilience mean to you? Yeah, so, you know, as a leader, it's about, number one, like uh, the mayor said, recognizing those challenges that are both seen and unseen. So you're trying to see around the corner and predict what's happening. And, and when you have a team of people that you're leading, making sure that they're going to be doing their best, right? If you've hired good people, if you've got good people on your team, they're going to be pushing themselves harder and harder and harder trying to rise to the challenge. And so as the leader, you have to recognize when they're getting close to that breaking point and intervene before they break. Um, and so that's that's part of the resiliency as a leader is that you have to change your leadership style and you have to change your focus. Um, and really, the other thing that changed about the leadership is um, I tend to be more of an ideas generator, let's all come together, let's work as a team. But when you're in the middle of a pandemic and things are changing sometimes by the hour, you've got to very quickly get input from your team, but then make a decision and maybe be a little bit more direct. And um, some people don't respond well to that. And so that's another piece of the resiliency is making sure that you're following back up and having those conversations with your team so that they are not uh, succumbing to the pressure of the situation. Yeah, that, that's another very interesting aspect of, of resilience in terms of making the decisions within the short time frame that obviously in the midst of the pandemic or, or any other emergency you have to do. Um, Fritz, on, on your side, I'm sure resilience has been so important to, you know, yeah. to be in the ICU day in and day out with you know, the, the COVID patients that, that your hospital is taking care of. What, what, what can you tell us about how, how you view this quality of resilience? For me, our, our situation was so unique because what was going on externally with our patients, right, in our community. So my major focus was really my team and making sure that personally that they would be able to outlast what was going on. The challenge that we had, if you think about majority of the times in a normal setting, we know an end date to whatever event that's happening. What we saw was all the predictions just kept, it kept going and kept going. So it was like, when is this going to be over? So one of the major things was making sure that um, personally that our people were able to deal with it. A lot of times we think about what's happening at the workplace, but what's happening in our personal lives and how that's affecting them. I've had a lot of nurses come to me and say, hey, my father's going, having a heart attack. I need to be there. So then what we had to do is be able to adjust to what's going on in their personal lives and realizing the needs of the unit, but then also what's helping our staff come back the next day and not burn out. So that was um, one of the biggest things that we had to deal with, um, including everything else that's been mentioned. Yeah, yeah that, that point about balancing the professional lives and the personal lives is, is so key with all of the blurring of the lines that have happened in the last 18 months. Um, and I'd, I'd like to, to learn more about that um, as, as we keep this conversation going. But I'm going to go back to you, Mayor Nuremberg, and, and ask you about what you described as the mental fortitude, right? So th definitely it's very important in these situations with emergencies, disasters, pandemics, and stuff like that. How do you personally work on your own mental fortitude 
on your own first, but then how do you model that and convey that to your team and to the people who work with you? Well, I couldn't agree more with what Fritz said about, about the team and how important that is because the people that are around you can either take energy or give you energy and you are also that kind of force with them. And so uh, the collaboration and, and awareness of the wellness of the entire team is really important. Personally, uh, for me, um, uh, that's why I work out. I mean, I, I used to do it for fun. It's terrible now. It's very painful. Uh, but I do it because it's important to maintain mental wellness. And so I've, in, in my life, if I, don't, if I don't have a workout, um, I start to get cloudy, my thoughts. I, I start to get agitated easily. So uh, I, I'm, I'm not kidding you. The pandemic was very good for my workout regimen um, because I couldn't go to the gym anymore, so I took some stuff out of the shed and I put it, set it up in the garage. I didn't miss it, a workout for the entire pandemic. Uh, I was always there at morning, noon, or night. So the, the connection between physical well-being and mental wellness to me has always been very profound. Uh, the other thing is just being able to unplug enough to regain your own mental edge. Um, and for me, it's things like, you know, sitting on the back porch when everybody goes to sleep and listen to some music and, and have a beer. Um, but then when you get back into, you know, focus mode, again, making sure that the team is around you, uh, is, is, is there, is prepared, uh, is also uh, balanced and, and feeling good. So um, I don't know if that answers your question, but that's sort of, yeah. Yeah, but I, I mean, I think you mentioning that you didn't miss a workout in the last 18 months <laughs> with all that you have to do puts the rest of us at shame. I mean, <laughs> what's our excuse for missing workout? Well, if it's right there, um, <laughs> yeah. then, you know, it's, it's, uh, you, you have no excuses. You know, this, this reminds me of, of an interview I read uh, with President Obama when he was in office, and he mentioned the same exact thing. He said he would work out every single day while he was in office. And that was at the time when I wasn't working out, and I was saying to myself, if the president has time to work out, what's my excuse? And, and I think for well, us today, if the mayor has time to work out, what's our excuse? I didn't mean to put it that way, but <laughs> the point is, it's got to be part of the formula of your own well-being. And if you don't program it in, I, I'll, I'm more willing to miss a, a an hour of sleep or, or 45 minutes of sleep if that means I can at least have that portion to stay balanced. Because I know I can catch up on sleep or whatever, but, but having that time to unplug and, and really get the stress out and have that balance against, again between physical and mental is extremely important. I've, I've found it's, it's very important for me uh, to maintain, maintain that balance. So you, you make it as programmed a part of your day as taking a vitamin in the morning. Yeah, yeah. That's a great point. So, so Fritz, the mayor talked about the importance of unplugging, right? He goes in the back porch, listens to music. What, what have you done to try to unplug despite all of the demands on your time and on your attention? Well, first thing is I have dreamt about working out every day. <laughs> 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 uh, interestingly enough, I'll tell you what not to do. So anyone that knows me is, I normally, if the situation gets harder, I'm going to just work twice as hard. At some point during the pandemic, I realized this was not the formula. Because I started to realize I no longer had the creativity that I used to have. Um, it was just, a lot of things started to become reactive rather than proactive. And so I realized that, wait a minute, I had to change my formula. Um, so one thing is definitely try to eat healthier if I'm not able to get to the gym. Um, but then also I had to realize I had to change my perspective during this pandemic. Um, a lot of times part of the reactive nature is that you can start saying, I can't believe this is happening. How long is this going to last? Look at my team. But then I had to start shifting and saying, okay, for me personally, I had to start getting back to sharpening my toolbox, if you will. So I started 
reading more leadership books so that I can help my team. How do I help navigate them through this? And so I really started to resort back to the, th the tools that I learned within this program and saying, okay, what leadership books I need to start looking at so therefore I can educate my team and then help guide them. So to me, that's what I really focused on during um, this pandemic. Yeah, yeah. You know, you, you made a lot of great points, but I want to pinpoint that your first comment there about how we view resilience typically in general in leadership, but especially in healthcare, on the healthcare side. We think resilience is about how you endure, but the science actually shows resilience is about how you recharge. It's not about how you endure, right? It's not about let me grind through and power through one more month, two more months. It's about how do I take time to take a break and then I can come back stronger to do what I have to do. So I, I thought that was that was a, a really good insight. Dr. Emmons, what have you done personally to keep taking care of yourself so you can take care of others during this time? Yeah, absolutely. So they've already mentioned a lot of good stuff. Exercise is key. Um, you know, just being able to mentally disengage, get some of that frustration out with whatever physical activity you're doing. You know, the, the interesting thing about the pandemic was the first few months, the world just stopped. You know, everybody went home and you got to kind of circle around with your nuclear family and it was fantastic, right? We were talking earlier about how our kids didn't have 600 activities that we were running to all day and night. Um, but then, and so even at work, the pressures, it was just like pandemic, pandemic, do COVID, whatever you need to do. But then after a few months, you're like, okay, this isn't going away and we still have to do the regular business. I still have to make sure as a family medicine doctor, my women are getting their mammograms. I have to do it in a different way, but their cancer screening is still important even though we're fighting this COVID thing. And so um, as people started working from home, coming around and answering the question that um, Dr. Kaisi asked, it really is about setting those firmer work-life boundaries. Um, you know, we already were way overconnected before the pandemic. It was nice to disconnect and, and have that restful break. And it really kind of highlighted what was really important, what wasn't. And so as a leader, I really push that on my team. The work is going to be there. There's always going to be more to do. Um, so the evenings are really about like, okay, I don't want to see any emails at 10 p.m. If you can't sleep and you're sending me an email at 10 p.m., I'm not answering it until at least 7.30 in the next morning, right? So we put very specific boundaries on when, when the expectation was to do that work. And that actually helped us disengage a little bit and your brain gets to wander. My favorite place is to, um, in the shower, I have a little radio, I put on my favorite 90s music, um, something upbeat in the morning, so I'm not quite awake yet, and I'm just kind of there, and I come up with the best ideas in the shower um, because my mind has time to relax. And so really that's what I was encouraging my team is to, to let your mind wander, and then you're gonna come up with better ideas and be more resilient. Yeah, I agree. 90s music, best fuel for, for, for resilience, <laughs> hands down, hands down. Um, I'm, I'm going to stay with you for, for a minute here because what, what we've talked about so far is first, how do you take care of yourself, right? And, and we, we um, brainstormed some ideas. Now, when you've taken care of yourself, how do you start then taking care of the team? You know, one of the things you mentioned earlier is to make sure that the team is still doing a good job, that they're able to make decisions and all of that. So what, what are some tips and insights that you have about taking care of the team of the people who work with you. Yeah. You know, that's the other interesting thing to reflect on as the pandemic has gone by. At first it was like healthcare heroes work here and yay essential workers and people were bringing food to the hospital and it was wonderful. Now we're in a very different phase and not only are we not getting food from outside places, but we actually have a lot of very angry people in our facilities, um, especially in the ICU. I hear this from my ICU colleagues, but also in the clinics. You know, they're, they're very demanding. They're very frustrated with everything. And, and you know, pe sick people tend to be more demanding and emotional anyway. But it really is something like we've never seen before. Um, and so having to be that cheerleader now that the rest of the community was at the beginning of it all. That's really been um, key in trying to figure out ways to do that creatively so it doesn't, you don't want it to just be a platitude. You want them to understand that you really care, you're really trying to support them, you're doing everything you can, and you know, sometimes lunch is it, sometimes coffee is it, but sometimes it's just allowing them to come in and vent um, and realize that it's nothing personal, they just need to have an outlet. So it's been difficult. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so, so, you know, this, this cheerleading quality is, is so important. And I'm going to go back to the mayor here and ask you, you know, your role is not just to take care of your immediate team of the people who work with you, but to take care of the whole city in a way. 
what have you done other than self-care to be able to be a cheerleader, be a force of optimism and positivity for the whole community? Still working on that. Um, that's been a challenge, uh, there's no doubt. Uh, the morale of uh, communities nationwide has been uh, really hit hard. Um, you know, the, the psyche of a community uh, ebbs and flows with the, with the numbers that are in the hospital, the, the people who are passing away in our own families and friend circles, and, and to hear the stories that are coming out of the hospitals about people going in and really taking out their frustration on the healthcare workers is really devastating. Uh, I would say that San Antonio, fortunately, uh, stands apart uh, in many ways from other communities and that we know um, how to deal with adversity uh, a little bit differently. I would say better than a lot of others. Uh, that I think comes from our history, our roots as a very multicultural city, a city that's been through extraordinary challenges and, and contests. Um, but what we did was that we tried to just, um, so I had a, a, a moment uh, on the steps of the courthouse after the murder of George Floyd and there were protests out there um, as there were in every city. And I made a, a, a statement or several statements and one of them was that I'm the mayor of the city and I want people to take their frustrations and not direct them to other people um, that really are maybe just standing by watching what's happening, but direct your frustration to the people who are in charge that can do something about it. And, and in doing so, that's me. That's me. If there's something that's not going right with this situation, I'm there to fix it. I'm there to work on it. And so part of my answer is probably not a healthy one, but it is to direct your frustrations and, and allow the people who are willing to bear that burden to bear it for the community. And so that's what, uh, that was what um, I mainly wanted to impart uh, that day, but that's also one of the approaches that Judge Wolf and I have taken by getting on TV every day just to give people the facts, giving them the information that they needed to protect themselves, protect their families and businesses, talk about the good and the bad, and everything in between. And so people knew that we were aware and we weren't going to try to sugarcoat anything. We're going to let you know what it is. And you build a level of trust and confidence with what you're saying and what you're doing that when we say, you know, we're doing really well. Go out there and have fun. Go to, the, go to your neighborhood restaurant. Um, go come to this event. Go cheer on the, the Trinity Tigers and the UTSA Roadrunners. Do that because you can and you can be safe doing it as long as you pay attention to the protocols. Um, and also, by the way, don't take your frustration out on your nurse. Um, that there was a level of confidence and trust with what we were saying that people could let their tension be released a little bit. Um, I think there's going to be volumes written about the psychology of cities and communities that we've experienced over the last two years. That's been our approach. Uh, whether it's been successful, I think time will tell. But um, watching what's happening here in San Antonio and my peers and what they're going through in other cities in the country, I would say we're, we're probably doing it the right way, if there is one. Yeah. It, it sounds to me like one of the important strategies here that, that you've done is constant periodic communication with the community. And I know from my perspective as a citizen of, of, of this community, you know, your daily updates during the pandemic and beyond have always been a source of, of reassurance and of knowing what's actually happening in, in our city. So, so definitely communication is, is um, a very important aspect of maintaining and building that resilience within the community at large. Um, Fritz, I want to go back to you to, to see how that looks from your perspective. Um, I know from a lot of people who work with you that, that you are you know, an admired leader and people love working with you. So what, what have you done with your staff in the ICU to, to make sure that they remain positive, they remain optimistic, and they, they remain resilient? So I just want to give you guys a little idea of how our day looks. Imagine waking up, going to work, and within an hour, there's a code blue, 27 year old in there, COVID patient that's been in there for about four weeks, just died, that you've been working on, trying to keep them alive. And the person that has to deal with that 
Although we're sad is their family of a 26 year old wife, three kids. And then you have another next day, 42 year old, day after 44 year old. And so what I saw was this decline of our team's morale. And you saw two different phases, if you, if you will. The first one, so when the first big surge, the team was able to really take it in and kind of rally by themselves because they're like, hey, this is new, I'm scared, I don't know what I may bring to my family, but the community is rallying behind us, we are heroes. The second one, the surge, it felt like the community did not care. No longer was the community trying to social distance, mask, get vaccinated, and, and they were just, just felt beat up every day. And so as a leader, when you're seeing this, part of the thing is to make sure that my team realizes what they're doing is making a difference. You know, when we're in the systems that we are in, you start thinking about metrics, right? We, we are still trying to prevent infections, but at the same time, we're trying to make sure that our team has the support that they need. And so what I try to focus on is remind them of the purpose of why we're there. Because to me, when you establish the purpose, it keeps you going. So we talk about, hey, finding the great you know, storylines of a COVID patient that actually survived and what that was, that moment felt to their family members and let our team know so that they can continue going on. We definitely focus on recognizing each other. We started thank you cards just from colleagues because, you know, once again, you're going to work. What are we going to do to replenish? Because we're such, we're in a service industry. And so it's hard to continue to provide that level of service if you're not refilling. So. Thank you cards, recognizing our team. We started employee of the month, um, getting recognition from our patients. Um, we're definitely, and then ta different tactics like rounding on our staff. One of the things that I tell my team is, come to my office, it's a safe place. This is Disney World. Come in here, yell and everything, but then when you step outside, I need you to get in character. You know, so it seems to help. So those, those little things have really seemed to keep us going right now and just keep the morale steady. Yeah. You know, that, that last point about the importance of gratitude, appreciation towards the team members is so important and it's definitely backed up by the science of resilience. You know, the research studies looking at what keeps teams resilient are, are those teams that constantly express that to each other. So, so my question to you, Marissa, is in addition to that, what have you found to be helpful, you know, other than gratitude? Are there other um, aspects of your role as a team that, um, as a team leader, that, that you've put in place to continue to maintain and build that resilience? Absolutely. So kind of two other facets of my, my role is I'm co-chair of our Honeycomb Project, which is something we started back in 2016 with the intention of trying to help fight physician and, and APC burnout um, and that sort of thing. But we realized as we were formulating the program that if we can make our clinics and our facilities a place where physicians and APCs want to come work, then we've probably improved things to where our staff wants to work there. And then that means we've made it a place that patients want to come receive care. So that's why we didn't call it the Physician Wellness Program, we called it the Honeycomb Project. Um, and so that project has still continued. We've been, we've expanded, we've finally been able to start our peer support program. Um, now that we have grown from, initially we had about 200 physicians and APCs over South Texas and parts of Louisiana. Um, Christus Health has grown and now we have over 1,100. And so if you're an intensivist in Longview, Texas, and you want to talk to somebody who knows what you're going through, and it doesn't have to be work. It could be, you know, my kids at home on virtual learning and they're failing first grade, or, you know, my, my parents just died, or, you know, whatever. Life happens. Life is still happening. Um, we can connect you with somebody kind of similar um, stage of career, um, similar experiences, but not in your immediate vicinity. Um, so we'll pair you up with somebody in San Antonio so that you guys can bond and share and create a, a community that you didn't have before. So really we've been looking for those opportunities to form community. 
The other piece that we've done, um, so I was also the uh, operations lead for our clinics here in San Antonio and New Braunfels. Um, so we had Snowmageddon and we converted EMRs and we had a couple of other things happening along the way. And so it was really about focusing of like, look, we're in the middle of all of this, we're trying to do these things and we're gonna change your computer system on you. But look at all the cool things the computer system does. Look how it's gonna be a better tool for you to take better care of patients. Look at how we're able to do telemedicine. We've been wanting to do, we've had the technology to do telemedicine for a decade or more, but we've never been able to do it because there were all these regulations and stipulations and could you get reimbursed and all of that stuff. And there is still a business side of, of healthcare, right? Unfortunately, we've got to keep our doors open. Um, all of that went out the window with the pandemic. So really getting the teams to focus on all the fun, outside of the box things that we've been able to do, ways we've been able to care for patients. Um, we turned Morgan's Wonderland parking lot into a COVID vaccination um, area. That was so much fun. And we really focused on those patients that don't do well going into facilities, right? We, they stayed in their car, we were able to take care of them. Um, and that really lifted the spirits of my team, being able to see the smiles, um, the tears of joy on parents' faces because they're like, I can't take my special needs 30 year old child into a clinic. They will fight me, they're bigger than me but I can have them sit in the car. They're happy sitting in the car. And now I know my child is safe and vaccinated, right? Because that is still their child. Um, so really focusing on all of the opportunities that we've had in healthcare, which we tend to overlook. And so pausing for a second to do that has been helpful. Yeah, yeah that's great. You know, you, you started by talking about burnout, mm -hmm. right? And, and you know, for, for those who are with us in the audience who are not healthcare people, this this is a term that we use we use a lot in healthcare. Um, you know, it started with physician burnout and nurse burnout and provider burnout, but now we're talking also about administrator burnout, leader burnout. Everyone is being burnt out, and we were having a conversation with with the students the other day about the importance of recognizing that. So I want to go back to you, Mayor Nuremberg, and ask you, you know about this, this burnout or chronic stress or endless fatigue and all of that, how are you experiencing that with your own team, with you know, the team with you in, in the city? And, and you know, what are some of the things that you guys are doing structurally, like, like Marissa described, to, to deal with some of that burnout? Yeah, well, there, there's, a, there's a team in the mayor's office and then there's a team in the city organization. Um, so I'll just I'll focus on the team in the mayor's office right now. I can't agree more with what Marissa is saying in terms of um, you know, having opportunities to experience sort of the full emotional spectrum with your team is very, very important. Um, laughter being the most important. Uh, I would say that the, the, the hallmark of any of the teams that I've been on that have been the strongest have been that we laugh almost as much as anything else, including talking. And we do that on my team. Um, I think, uh, you know, there, there is a long list of mayors uh, who have since decided, since the pandemic, not to seek re-election. Um, and I think it's a, it's a function of, of burnout. I think it's a function of the fact that this has been sort of like adrenaline overdrive for the last 19 months. And I've described it. Um, at some point, the merry-go-round is going to stop. And we're going to have a little bit of adrenal, adrenaline withdrawal. Um, luckily for us at local government, the merry-go-round never stops. <laughs> um, but you know, for, for us, I think it's, it's really about spending as much t quality time with your team to uh, celebrate success, uh, recognize achievement, um, and commiserate with the not so good times. Um, when, when we have a particularly tough meeting uh, or a challenging meeting, first thing I do is I go back to my office and we huddle in my comms director's office. It's, and we just sit around the table and we just make fun of what everybody did that day <laughs> and just complain about it out loud to each other. Of course, shadow mouse rules, nothing ever leaves that room. But uh, we just have, a, we have an opportunity to let everything out. Um, and that, to me, is bonding. And when you know that somebody is there in the foxhole with you experiencing what you're experiencing and you know uh, you're not alone, uh, it, it, it means the world. And, and this has been 
a mental health crisis across the country, across the world with regard to the pandemic. Every mental stressor that has existed in a person's life was exacerbated by the pandemic. And our main message to folks, especially when we're trying to get the mental health and suicide hotline numbers out there, is you are not alone. Knowing that you're not alone makes the world much different to someone experiencing that stress. The, the importance of, of laughter and joking around and having fun, you know, might seem counterintuitive in the midst of a crisis or a pandemic, but it's exactly what you need sometimes, right? And, and what you're talking about is, is, you know, this concept of you take your work seriously, but you don't take yourself too seriously in, in these kind of situations. So I, I'm, I'm glad that you, you brought that up and the importance of that. So I know we're, we're reaching the end of our time together, and my experience those panel discussions, the best ones are the short and sweet ones. So we're going to keep it short and sweet. But I want to give you all the opportunity to say one last word. We have a lot of young leaders in the audience. And what, what advice would you have for them um, in terms of continuing to build and maintain their resilience as they enter um, the, the, the real world, so to speak, in, in the next few years? So Fritz, we'll start with you. Um. My advice would be twofold. One, remember that whatever you're going through, you're dealing with people. We overcomplicate things. We look at different data points or what have you, but at the end of every data point, there's someone behind it. So realizing that you're dealing with individuals and then meet that head on. Other is thinking about yourself holistically. Myself as a nurse, that's how I was trained, and that's how I look at my management structure. How do I deal with people, mind, body, and soul? When you connect that way, you're able to make a difference in people's lives and then also with yours. So. That's great advice. Thank you. I saw you up next. Yeah, so one thing that I do, you know, we can all do, like Fritz said earlier, we can all do hard stuff for a period of time if we know it's going to end. Um, it's when we kind of end up in that hole that it's harder to pull ourselves back out of over and over again. So what I do is every three months I have a checkpoint. I literally put it on my calendar to remind myself to pause and take at least 15 minutes to examine my situation, my work situation, my home situation, my hobbies, just the whole situation. And not just what's going wrong, but what's going right. And how do I include more of that into my life? And that's kind of how I stumbled upon the music in the shower thing. Because I was like, I, I get energized with music. So I need more music in my life. I'm not in the car very much right now. So I'm going to put it in the shower, right? Um, so that three-month check-in really allows me to kind of take a, a holistic approach to everything going on in my life. And if something's not going right, that next three months, I can look back and say, you know, that's actually getting worse. Um, so I actually had to change my, my job within Christus um, because it was, it was getting to be too much. Um, and I was able to go before I broke, before um, I was burned out, and say, hey, boss, you know, I, I think we need some help. I think we need to change the team a little bit. And it took some time, but we got there, and I am much happier. We've, our team has grown. Everybody's doing much better. So really, that three-month check-in um, has kept me moving through my career. Wow. Radic check-ins, that's, that's great. All right, Mayor Nurmik, we'll, we'll have you have the, the last word here and words of advice for our <laughs> really future tough. generations. Uh, Whenever I'm asked to give advice to college students, my, my advice is don't sign up for the free credit card. <laughs> That's a great bad idea. That's a great one. Um, no, I, I'll, I'll be a little hokey and I'll, I'll, I'll uh, channel my inner Bruce Lee and say, be water, my friends. Um, it is about adaptability, in my opinion, uh, being able to pivot not being afraid to test your own assumptions about a situation, maybe even change your mind. There's nothing wrong with changing your mind if you have new information, uh, but being able to adapt to the situation. You know, human beings are, I'm not a doctor, but I learned about general adaptation syndrome. And human beings, the body is very resilient because it adapts to stressors. Your, your mental capacities need to do the same thing. And I, I feel like sometimes we're a little bit too hard-headed for our own good, but be adaptable, be water. Yeah, so with, with the wise words of Bruce Lee, we'll, we'll end this session, but for the sake of our young students, can you tell them who Bruce Lee is? <laughs> <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> no, that's okay. um, A great philosopher of our time. There you go, there you go. Well, I want to thank you all for your time, Mayor Nuremberg, Fritz, Dr. Evans. Thank you all for being here. We appreciate you, and thank you for, for our... Uh,